Would you stand up a signal as a sword?
say amen? Amen. If you're glad to be at Concord, say oh yeah. Oh yeah. Awesome. We are so glad that you're with us this morning. If you are a visitor with us this morning, uh, thank you for being with us. We have a gift for you in the foyer. It's a coffee mug for uh, just coming and being a part. But if you want to, you can click on the QR code that's in front of you, and there's a little uh, form for you to sign up. Tell us a little bit about yourself and how we can introduce ourselves to you. Uh, There's a lot of things that are happening this week. It's exciting. It's Pentecost Sunday today. It's Memorial Weekend today. We're celebrating our graduates today. So we are very glad that you are with us. This week on Thursday, we're having backyard games with the boys. Uh, So you probably heard this uh, the last couple of weeks, but please uh, come Thursday evening. Low key, we're gonna throw some meat on the grill. We're gonna play some yard games, some cornhole and some different things out in the front yard and just have a great time of uh, hanging out with each other as summer starts. So put that on your calendar to be there with us. Now, VBS is here. We had our volunteer meeting this morning over here in the hall. It was great, great turnout. Thank you for coming out uh, this morning to be a part of that. If you are not volunteering but want to volunteer, you still can. Uh, just see Pastor Dustin or you can email him, Dustin at ConcordNaz.com. Uh, this is an all church event and we need everybody pulling together to make this happen. So make sure that you sign up and sign up and register your, uh, your child. If you haven't done that already, do that and invite them to come be a part. Pastor John, what else? Well, I must tell you, we have been planning and planning and planning. We are very excited to announce what we are now calling Family Fusion Service. That's right. So uh, Fusion is a family service that is going to kind of take the place of what used to be the family service where all the kids are in the service on Sunday morning. So next week, we are going to have our very first Family Fusion, and uh, we're inviting uh, all the families in the community. It's it's a very kid-friendly, student-friendly um Uh, church service where we really want the kids to fall in love with coming to church. And so uh, we just want you to know it may look a little different next week, but that's okay because it's really for the kids. It's really for the family. It's really uh, targeted at uh, promoting the spiritual growth of our of our students and our children. And so if at all possible, would you just invite people that may, that service may speak to, that, that you know that God has put on your heart that those people need to be here in the service next week for that. Um, and so that's just normal 10 o'clock Sunday. We'll see you next week for that. And then if you notice, our calendar for the summer is vastly different. Um, and so we've got a ton of events up there. I know it may be hard to see, but that is online and in the email. If you wouldn't mind just going and checking to make sure that way you know what's going on and uh, be a part of some of these awesome events we've got this summer. Uh, I didn't have a chance last week to welcome a few special guests that were here. Carson and Sarah Ann are newlyweds. Will you welcome them back with us? And Saul and Mia are also back this week. Congratulations to Saul and Mia. Uh, Awesome to see their new lives. Hey, if you haven't met these uh, great young couples, I would encourage you to meet them uh, at some point today uh, and encourage them as they begin their journey of marriage together. We're going to receive tithes and offerings together. We uh, know that this is our first act of faith as we give back to God. It's not the last thing we do, but as we enter into relationship with him, the first thing that we do is say that everything we have comes from him. So I'm going to ask the ushers if they'll make their way forward this morning, and let's begin our day of worship by receiving tithes and offerings together. Heavenly Father, God, we are so thankful, grateful to be in your presence today. We ask, God, that you would uh, use these gifts, that you would multiply them for the use of your kingdom in our community, but also around the world. And above all, God, that this morning that we would open our hearts and minds to what you have to speak to us today. We come in with an air of excitement and a celebration and, and what uh, today means to us as the church as we celebrate Pentecost. But God, we also come together this morning and we understand that you are the audience this morning. We're not here for ourselves, but we're here to honor you, to give praise and worship to you for what you have done in and through us, God. The ability to be a part of your family. So this morning, wherever you want us to go, whatever you want us to do, may our answer be yes right now, that we will go and we will do whatever it is that you ask. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. As our ushers uh, take tithes and offerings this morning, we're going to celebrate graduates. I invite you to turn your attention to the screens this morning. Dear Savannah, wow, I can't believe this day is actually here. I know you've been waiting for this day since you started freshman year and that you're super excited to be here at this point in your life. I also know that you're super nervous to be starting college in the fall, but I know that you're going to do great 
You just have to get there and see for yourself. You might wonder, how can I be so sure you're going to do great? Well, it's because I've seen you overcome things before in your life, and you did amazing. Remember kindergarten year? I know all of you listening are thinking, what? It's just kindergartening. But not for Savannah. She had a very tough teacher that didn't start out her school life very well. But you, Savannah, overcame and persevered. You continued to thrive through all your school years being a perfectionist, being a very conscientious student and always aiming to please. Another big hurdle was when you were diagnosed with severe scoliosis. We chose the route to retrain your brain and continued to go to New York every three months for three years for treatments to get you through your growing years. Along with that came hours of work on your part at home every day, but you did it. You overcame and persevered. We have so many memories together of those times in New York, some good, some bad, even some scary, but mostly full of lots of laughs and lots of cherished time. Now you're here standing before us as a graduate of Ravenwood High School. You made it through COVID, through the crazy start and stop of the sophomore year, all the online classes and work with the Chromebook every day, and you survived being the last kid at home. It wasn't so bad, was it? You overcame and persevered. You see, that is how I know you're going to do great in college. You are a hard worker, a loyal friend, and you look to the Lord to guide you. And when it comes to crunch time, you stay focused. Put your mind into everything you do and get the job done. Keep your eyes on the Lord. Continue to be the best you can be, and you will overcome and do great things. Remember, Samantha, Jared, Christian, Adam, Dad, and I will be there to support you through everything. We love you, love, mom and dad. Dearest, my perfect, amazing offspring. For those who don't know, this is how Annika entered her contact details in her mom's phone. Congratulations on reaching a momentous event in your life. You are officially now on the road to pursuing your career dreams. The next few years will be some of the best and hardest years of your life. You will experience growth, freedoms and choices we as your parents have been preparing you to face for your whole lifetime the growth will come in the form of testing your patience tight deadlines making choices between studying and having fun otherwise known by the boring monikers of time management individual responsibility and accountability you will also experience failures and disappointments even when you do the right things that's okay Grieve over it and get right back up. Show the world what you are made of and who gives you strength in your weakest moments. 1 Corinthians 12.10 During these downturns, remember to trust in the Lord with all your heart and he will make your path straight. Proverbs 3.6 Now on to the fun stuff. Being away from home will be like a sleepover every night especially when you have the coolest of roommates and no more Indian food forced upon you. You just show up at the cafeteria and eat whatever you want. No setting the table or cleaning up after dinner. The relationships you will create during these next few years will be some of the strongest ones you will lean on as you navigate the rest of your life. They will come in different shapes, sizes, and interests. But these friends will be your forever friends. Enjoy the carefree moments of just hanging out and chatting, exploring, and studying with people who will challenge you and help you in more ways than you would ever imagine needing help. As you start your college journey, let Isaiah 43, 19 keep you on the path you are embarking on. Look, I am doing a new thing. Now it sprouts up. Don't recognize it? I am making a way in the desert, paths in the wilderness. We love you dearly, and you will be missed immensely. And thank goodness for FaceTime to get us through the times we are not with you. My perfect, amazing offspring. Love your daddy and mommy. I made the mistake of looking over at their eyes during the video and uh yep it, it's contagious the the happiness the tears we are so proud of our graduates Annika Savannah you guys have excelled uh and exceeded our wildest beliefs um and imagination 
we would love to invite you on stage to give you something. Uh, and just before I do that, I just, y'all come, come on up and I'll just, I just want to take a minute to kind of give like a little personal testimony of you guys. Savannah, I've known you almost your entire life. Um, and this is one of those fun moments where I get to see you from the children's group to the youth group. And now I hand you off into the college group and you have grown so much. I'm so proud of you. I got you a little thing. There's a bunch of words in this book. There's the Bible in this book, so that's good. But um, a bunch of the youth sponsors got together one night and all wrote you letters uh, of encouragement and just things that we think you might wanna hear uh, as your journey continues. It's just the next step. But I want you to know that I'm proud of you and that I love you and I'm always here for you. Hey, girl. Um, so, yeah, you had a big day uh, this weekend, but also um, this moment I know you've probably been looking forward to the most. Um, sure, she walked across the stage. Um, I got here like five years ago, and there were not very many girls in this youth group, were there? There was like, hey, I'm Annika, and, uh, and, and the guys are like, that's Annika, she's our girl. And, um, and somehow you stuck around. You decided that this place was important to you, and we decided you were important to this place. And uh, you have always got a home here. You have people that will love you forever. You've made a bigger impact in my life and in the people's lives in this youth group and this community than you would expect a teenager to be able to do. But you, I wrote it in the book in case I couldn't get the words out, but I'm proud of you, and I love you. And continue to be a leader uh, in your next step. And um, I'm always here for you. You met me at my lowest moment. You saw me at my very worst. When I expected disappointment Love was all I heard My sin was deep Your grace was deeper My shame was wide Your arms were wide Your love was greater still. Would you stand up and sing with us? You answered me when I was naked. You pulled me in your righteousness. You pulled me in your daily darkness.
more time My sin was deep Your grace was deeper My shame was wide Your arms were wider And my guilt was great Your love was greater still This is my surrender. Here is where I lay it down. Every lie and every doubt. This is my surrender. Sing it loud this morning. I will make room. I will make room for you. Sing, it's worth it 
have to admit that I love graduation Sunday. I love uh, being able to uh, just celebrate this milestone in our students' lives. I think it's because once a youth pastor, always a youth pastor. So uh, I, uh, I just enjoy celebrating. And our students did graduate from high school. We also want to celebrate Dana Roundtree. I don't know if Dana is with us this morning or not. She might be watching online with, seems like a lot of us this morning. But um, she, uh, she earned her master's of education uh, from Treveca this past uh, weekend as well. So we want to congratulate her on that incredible uh, accomplishment too. Uh, Pastor John mentioned just real quickly uh, about our Family Fusion service next week, and maybe you've seen that on the writing and you're not really sure what Family Fusion is all about. Um, I got to tell you, I'm really, really excited for what next Sunday is going to look like. Uh, we've never done anything like this, so it could be great or it could be a train wreck. We really don't know, um, but we want you to come and watch and see what happens. <laughs> Um, and uh, we just want to say thanks for allowing us the freedom to be able to think outside the box and to do something creative like this. And it really is the definition of what we believe church is supposed to look like. It is a complete intergenerational service that is for moms and dads, grandmas and grandpas, as well as our kids too. So I don't want you to think it's just a kid's service next week and let that be an excuse for you to skip church. Do not skip church next week. Uh, you're going to want to be a part of this and you will miss out if you don't take the opportunity to uh, enjoy it. We've been praying about about it, and it's going to be a unique way to uh, serve and worship uh, our King. So we're excited about that uh, next week. But today we're going to be uh, in uh, the book of uh, John 21. We're going to be looking at the story of Peter as we continue in our series of questions Jesus asked, exploring some of the 300 different questions that, uh, that Jesus asked. And we're going to be looking at the life of Peter. Uh, Peter was in his 20s, when he was called by Jesus. Peter was uh, already married when he uh, met Jesus. And we understand that Peter, as we have studied over the years, Peter has a really big personality, all right? Taylor Swift would say he has a big reputation, all right? That is who Peter is. He's one of those quick-to-jump personalities. Have you ever met somebody in your life that is a 
uh, ready, fire, aim kind of person. You know what I'm talking about? Like they just say stuff before they think through. Well, that's Peter. He is just on the move. He is going. He's not thinking things through. He just in the moment just says what comes to his mind. And, and some people were really responsive to that and others didn't know how to take that when it came to this life of Peter. But uh, this fisherman with this great big personality meets Jesus. And when he meets Jesus, he drops everything to follow him. Everything. Leaves everything that he knows, everything that is comfortable, everything that, uh, you know, had him in his element. And he decides, I'm going to go all in with this guy. No hesitation. Of course, we also know that along the way that Peter has some moments uh, my grandma probably would have described Peter as uh, a little big for his britches, uh, if you know what I'm talking about. He had some moments where he felt like uh, his confidence came off as more of an arrogance in this conversation with Christ. And he makes this bold statement, and the statement is, I will never fail you. I can handle this. I can accomplish it on my own. I will never fail you. I will never uh, miss out on the mission. I will never stray from what you're trying to do. I will never abandon Christ. But we know how the story goes. Uh, if you're a college football fan, you get the old Lee Corso, not so fast, my friend, in this moment, right? In this moment, Jesus says, L listen, Peter, I, I get it. You, you've been following me, and you understand what this looks like, and you've been a great part of my ministry and relationship. But when it comes to this, none of us are immune to struggle. No one is immune to having moments of struggle or questions or thoughts or doubts or, or missteps along this mission with me. And in fact, Christ says, you're not only going to fail, but you're going to fail three times. And you're going to fail me three times before the rooster crows. And what happens? Exactly what Jesus says is going to happen because, well, he's Jesus. Peter does fail. He denies Jesus three times. And as we said a few weeks ago, it's very interesting to me that the scripture shows us that on that third time as he fails Jesus, Jesus' eyes meet Peter's in that moment. Jesus sees him in his failure. I don't know about you, but that has to be an intimidating moment. To make a statement that I'll never struggle, I'll never fail, I've got this down, I can handle this, I can do this. And to know that you have failed once, twice, and then on that third time that you fail, the man that told you were going to fail is actually watching you fail. Scripture says that in that moment, he realizes he's not immune to the struggle. In fact, he has failed, he has struggled, and it says that he weeps. He weeps. I think he, he's overcome with that weight. He's overcome with that guilt. He's overcome with that shame. Not only has he failed, but he was supposed to be a leader. He was supposed to be the one that others looked up to. And now in this role of leadership, he hasn't just failed himself, but he feels like he's been a failure to all those that he's been an example for, for all this time as well. He's filled with regret. And he's probably convincing himself that this is the moment that will forever define him. We do that too, right? In a moment of failure, we typically can't see beyond the moment of failure. We find ourselves in the midst of a struggle and all of a sudden we think, this is what I'll be forever known for. There's no coming back from this. There's no starting over from this. I've hit my lowest point in this moment. And then John 21, it leads all of that leads us into this. When I think about Peter's story, I think it's a lot like our story because I'm not sure that there's anybody in this room that can say that you have lived without failure. There shouldn't be because we're a room full of broken people. We're a room full of broken people that come in here every week seeking this restoration in this life with Christ. We seek this opportunity to look more like Jesus every day. So before we go any further, this is not a story that ends in failure, but it's a story that ends in redemption. It's a, it's a, it's a comeback story. It's a, a story of grace, a grace that restores Peter and a grace that is available for all of us. So if for some reason you blank out through the rest of this message today and you find yourself in Peter's uh, shoes and you feel like your struggle has defined you, I need to tell you that your struggle doesn't define you. 
your lowest moment, your worst moment in life, that doesn't define you. That is not who you are. But there is a grace that is available for us, and that grace that was available for Peter is also available for us, a grace that restores. I do find it interesting that all four gospel accounts mention Peter's betrayal, all four. But it's only John that talks about his restoration. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning. The story begins with Peter and the boys, and they are back in their hometown, and they are back to doing what they do best, fishing. At the core, they are fishermen. This was their lifestyle. This is after Jesus has returned from the grave. So Peter and the boys know that Jesus is back, and they have seen him, but they're still really unaware of what all that means in this moment. They're still trying to figure out this this promise that, that he would die and that he would come back. And Jesus told them to go back to Galilee and wait for instructions. So Peter, in typical Peter fashion, he just can't sit around and wait, okay? He has to do something. Something's in him. He just has to move. And so he decides to go fishing. The guys jump in the boat, and they head out, and they fish all night long. Now, the Sea of Galilee is a freshwater lake, so the fishermen in the room probably already understand what's happening in this moment. Because it's a freshwater lake, uh, the fish at night, they're fishing at night because during the day, they would be out in the deeper water. But at nighttime, they would make their way to the shallows of the water. Um, And so as they're uh, at at the night making it to the shallows of the water, I might have said that backwards, but you understand the Bible says, all right, they're in the shallows, all right? That's where they're at. They fish all night long and they catch what? Nothing. Nothing. They catch absolutely nothing. They get skunked, all right? Now, if you are a fisherman, no fisherman wants to just fish. A fisherman wants to catch, okay? If you are any kind of fisherman, I had a buddy of mine that uh, when we were in Florida, um, I was extremely uh, blessed. He had a beautiful boat, and he would take me deep sea fishing uh, often, and I loved it. It's one of my favorite things to do. And I said, oh, you fish. And he said, oh, no, Jason, I don't fish. I I catch, okay? So if you're coming with me, we are going to catch. So as we see this, I think that Peter, in this fragile state of mind that he had been through, I think this is just another one of those moments that kind of adds insult to injury. I mean, he had to have a moment where he was like, why is every single thing in my life going bad now? I mean, I get it, I failed, I made this promise, and then I failed, but now everything seems to be going wrong for me. I I failed Jesus, now I'm failing at fishing, and that's like the one thing that I know that is best, and and I imagine this frustration and probably even confusion that he's beginning to feel. It has to feel like everything is falling apart. Have you been there? Have you been there where you feel like everything in life is all falling apart at the exact same time? You walk into one trial and it feels like that one trial defines every aspect of your life. Because of this one thing that you're dealing with, now everything seems to be falling apart. And that's how I view Peter on the boat in this story. He's walking through and he's trying and he's doing everything he can to get back to what he feels like is normal, to get back to what is real life. But everything is falling apart. And after this long, frustrating night, verse 4 tells us that Jesus is at the shore. And the boys in the boat don't know that it's Jesus in this moment. John 21 says, early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore. But the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. So he called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. Again, insult to injury moment. Jesus says, do you have any fish? Knowing the answer already, but forcing them to admit their failure. Forcing them to vocalize No, we fished all night. We've done all we can do, but we failed. Then this stranger gives them some fishing advice that makes no logical sense whatsoever. If there's no fish on one side of the boat, then there's not going to be any fish on the other side of the boat. But they go ahead and they do what they've been asked to do. John 21.6 says, He said, 
throw your net on the right side of the boat and you'll find some. And when they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. The scripture tells us later that it was 153 large fish. And they quickly put together that this didn't just happen. This is a miracle. They're not unaccustomed to miracles. They know what they are. So in this moment, they begin to connect the dots with one another and put everything together. And this miracle is strangely similar to another miracle that happened in the same place, isn't it? When Christ called them to become fishers of men. There was the same exchange in this same location. And it's this full circle moment for all of them right now, but especially a full circle moment for Peter. See, his purpose was given to him by being a fisher of men and leaving behind this earthly fishing. He had gone back to his earthly ways, but now here is Christ calling him back into what this full circle is of what matters the most to Peter. Scripture says, then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him for he had taken it off and he jumped into the water and the other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish for they were not far from shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals with fish on it and some bread. So here's Peter just doing Peter things, right? Uh, Ready, fire, aim. He knows that it's Jesus, and he's not going to wait for the boat to take all that time to get there. He just jumps to him, and he begins to swim madly going towards Christ. The others make their way to shore, and in verse 12, we see that Jesus invites them to join him. Jesus is the one that offers the invitation to breakfast. While they're eating around this fire... I again imagine that Peter is is feeling this mix of emotions that are going on, grateful that Christ is there and grateful for the invitation and and grateful to be back with him. But I, I, I feel like he was probably in the presence of Jesus, but his failure was rolling around in the back of his head, haunting him for the things that he had done. He is excited to be amongst all of his friends, and he's excited to be in the presence of God, but he's come into the presence of God many times the same way that we come in on a Sunday morning, and we're really excited to be here, but our failure is haunting us in the back of our minds, and we can't just move away from it. What Peter is feeling is really the downfall that most of us experience still today. C.S. Lewis actually said it this way. He said that one of Satan's greatest strategies is for believers to be preoccupied with their, fa- with their failure because from then on, the battle is already won. You get that? We desperately want relationship with Christ, but that pain of our past mistake keeps Christ at an arm's length away from us because we're just not sure if we're ready to go all the way back in with him. Maybe because we don't feel like we deserve it. Maybe because we feel like we will fail again. And we so often remain frozen in our failure. We remain frozen being being letting that failure define who we are, unable to move on. And we just replay the mistake over and over and over again. Maybe our mistake is a mistake in our marriage that we wish we hadn't have done but we can't get it out of our mind. Maybe our mistake is things that we have have done or participated in, maybe at at work or in school or in a conversation. Maybe our mistake is a relationship that was broken that that we wish we could mend, but we don't feel like we can do on our own. Maybe our, our failure is a line that we drew in the sand and said we would never cross. We might get right up to it, but we would never do that. We would never go there. We would never be in that situation. But then we were. And so in this encounter with Christ, our failure, that line that was crossed, that thing that we said we would never do is what continues to roll around in our head. And we let that failure become our identity. We let our failure become who we are instead of a mistake that was made. Jesus offers this invitation. Come to him. He invites Peter to join him at the table. And Christ doesn't just invite Peter to join him at the table, but he invites each of us to join him at the table too. 
Christ's invitation wasn't, you are a failure, but okay, I'll let you come. Christ's invitation was, I know your failure, I know your mistakes, and I'm welcoming you to this relationship with me. I want relationship with you. I want the restoration process to begin. Jesus says, come on, join me. Let's have a conversation. The conversation is, let's talk about your past. Let's go ahead and put your mistake on the table. Let's put your failure out there. Let's talk about the failure that was, because I know that you didn't intend for it to be that way, but it's there. So let's vocalize the failure so that we can begin this invitation to restoration that I want to have with you. And Jesus initiates it all. He doesn't wait for Peter to do it. Jesus is the one that that shows up on the shore. Jesus is the one that prepares the fish. Jesus is the one that starts breakfast. Jesus is the one that offers the invitation. Do you know why? That's our God. That's our God. A God that invites, a God that welcomes, a God that desires and wants this relationship with us. He is a God that is always there. He is a God that is always pursuing us, never giving up on us. And he is ready to meet us right where we are. Jesus knew that they were on the boat. And he didn't wait for them to come back to the house. He went to where they were. He went to where they were doing what they thought was right to do. The only thing that they knew to do, the only distraction that they could find. And Jesus meets them right where they are. He's ready and he's desiring. He's chasing after us. But watch this. Jesus doesn't stop with restoring the relationship. That's just the first part. He doesn't stop with restoring relationship. He desires to restore our purpose. And that's what leads us to today, to the question that we're unpacking today, the question that Jesus says, do you love me? Do you love me? Probably one of the greatest questions that he asked. In in John 21, it says this. It says, uh, verse 15, when they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him a third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus stated, feed my sheep. Now it begins by saying Simon, son of John. Okay. Simon, son of John is this understanding because earlier we know that, that, uh, Jesus had changed, uh, name Jesus. Jesus had changed Peter's name from Simon to Peter. And he did it on purpose because it was an identifier. He was saying that you are solid. You are a rock. You are one that I can count on. You are one that I can build my ministry on. But in this moment, it's as if Jesus was saying, in your moment of failure, you reflected the old you more than the new you. And I'm calling you by your old name in this moment because you're acting like the old you. And I have transformed you. I have moved you to a man called Peter. But I'm reminding you that you were once a Simon. You once were someone that sought after these things. But when you met me, you were transformed and you were changed and you became Peter, someone that we could count on. So in this moment of weakness, you're reflecting more who you used to be than who you're supposed to be. So he begins with this understanding, but then he moves on. It's not condemnation, but it's just this reminder. Once we encounter Christ, we don't return back to our old ways anymore. Once we encounter Christ, we walk away from the old and become the new creation that God has asked us to be. But then he asked Peter the same question three times. The question we're studying today, he asked, do you love me three times? How many times had Peter failed? Three times. He failed three times. He's asked the same question three times. But here's what we need to know. There's, there's uh, different types of love, right? Okay, we, we know this. Um, if I say that I love my wife and I love to golf, those are drastically different types of love. Do we understand? Are you with me? Okay. Drastically different types of love. I love my kids and I love the Braves, but those are drastically different types of love. They are not the same. But we, in our own language, use the same word love to describe these different things. But in the original biblical language, in the Greek, these names were described as different types of love with different names. 
An agape love was a selfless, sacrificial, highest form of love. A phileia love was a brotherly love with one another. And then the eros love was the passionate love, a love that you would find within marriage. So first, Jesus asked Peter, do you agape me? Do you love me with this selfless, sacrificial, highest form of love? And Peter responds, I phileia you. I, I failed. I let you down. I messed up, but I'm not worthy of the highest form of agape love. I'm not worthy. I love you as a brother, but I can't love you with this highest agape love. The second time, again, Jesus says, do you agape me? Again, I'm asking you a second time. Do you love me with the highest form of love? And he says again, no, I love you with a a brotherly love, but I don't love you with this, this highest form of love. And Jesus says, feed my sheep. And then a third time, Jesus actually says, do you love me with a brotherly love? He changes the, the word love on the third time, and he meets Peter right where Peter is at. And he says, do you love me like a brother then? If you don't love me here, and I understand what you're saying, do you love me where you're at? And this is why Peter is hurt. Because it's not just saying, do you love me the third time? And so it's the third time of asking that hurts Peter's feelings. It's that Christ said, okay, well then do you at least love me like a brother? And he says, of course I love you like a brother. I've never not loved you as a brother. I just feel unworthy. Guys, we probably come into church And there are times where we feel like it is hard for us to worship and raise our hands. And it is hard for us to say that I am completely sold out all in with you because in our minds, we know that we have failed or there are struggles. And we say, God, I do love you, but I'm not worthy of loving you completely. I'm not worthy of full acceptance back in relationship with you. And that's where Peter is at in this moment. He knows that he hasn't matured to this agape love. But Jesus doesn't ask Peter if he's sorry. He doesn't say, are you sorry for your failure? Do you regret your failure? The question is, do you love me? And he doesn't make Peter promise that he wouldn't fail again. He doesn't say, okay, so you did fail, but will you you not do it again? Will you promise me that you'll never fail me again? Because he knows that Peter is broken. He knows that Peter is just like one of us. That, that there's this humanness, this struggle, this fail that is within us. And so he's not asking him for perfection in this moment. But he wants to know the condition of Peter's heart. Do you love me? Do you desire relationship with me? He wants to know that his heart is humble and that it's honest about his past. Willing to admit past failure. And he wants to know that he's able to confess that failure. And Jesus is saying, even though you fell short, I just need you to know, or I just need to know, do you love me? And Peter exclaims, yes, you know I love you. Guys, in moments of failure, We often don't wake up in the morning with the intent to fail. We don't wake up and we don't decide to just destroy our marriage. We don't wake up and decide to destroy relationship with our children. We don't wake up and decide to to cross a line that we we, we said we never would cross. We don't do this intentionally and decide to, to just throw our lives away. And Peter in that moment was in that same state of mind. We don't stop loving Christ when we failed. We've always loved him, and yet we admit our failure. And here is Peter in that moment saying, I, there was never a moment I didn't love you. I just know that I failed. Jesus is saying, even though you fell short, I still love you. Peter's asked the question three times, and there's an important statement that's happening in these three times of, of asking him. The first time is an opportunity to confess sin. And when we fail Christ, the first thing that we have to do is confess that we failed. We have to own it. We have to live up to it. We have to admit to it. Confess our sin. The second question of Christ saying, do you love me? The opportunity for us is to understand the depth and the weight of our failure. When we sin, we do create separation. We do do create this this separation from God that, that he doesn't want us to have. And third, we receive forgiveness. Do you love me? Confess sin. 
Do you love me? Understand the depth of your sin. Do you love me? Receive forgiveness from your sin. It's a process of restored life with Christ. But remember, he doesn't stop at restoration, but Christ provides purpose. Peter thought his failure disqualified him for his calling. Instead, Jesus is saying, no, now that you're restored, let's get back to work. Now that you are restored, let's get back to your purpose. Because here's what happens. When we are restored, we are then recommissioned back for the kingdom of God. When Christ restores us, he gives us purpose. For Peter, that purpose was to pastor people. That was his heart. That was what he wanted to do. And he does just that. And on Pentecost Sunday, who is the preacher on Pentecost Sunday? Peter, the one that has been restored. He is the one that speaks on this most vital, important day to the history of the church. The day when the Holy Spirit comes, the day when the church was formed. And on that day, that specific day, 3,000 believers come to Christ. And they come to Christ. And the speaker of that day was someone was a, who was a failure who had been restored and recommissioned and given purpose. That's what the life of Christ looks like. Peter became one of the most influential men in the entire New Testament. He teaches and he trains church leaders and all the way up to experiencing the exact same death as Jesus. Peter was also crucified the same way that Christ was crucified, only Peter was crucified upside down, opposed to our Savior who was crucified on the cross. You know what that means to me? Peter did some serious damage for the kingdom of God. To make somebody that angry and mad, to not only crucify you, but to crucify you upside down because of how much damage he had done to their way of life. That is Peter. Peter was not known by his failure. Peter was known by this restored life. Peter wasn't perfect after that. We can look through and there are other uh, opportunities, there are other things that, that Peter showed that he struggled and he had moments of failure, but that grace that was given to him continued to flow throughout his life. And it all begins with that question, do you love me? What is the intention of your heart? What is your desire? What is your hope? It was an opportunity to confess sin, to walk in repentance and to receive this gift of grace. And it's a beautiful beautiful picture that leads to this day that we celebrate. It's a gorgeous picture of what life can look like that is transformed. And do you know why it's such a beautiful picture? Because it's our picture too. Peter's life is a mirror of my life and it's a mirror of your life. Somebody that's lost hope, somebody that thought that they were no longer worthy, someone that thought that they had been disqualified to be used for the future was restored. We may have failed, but we've never been forgotten. We may have had moments of failure, but God never stopped pursuing us. He never stopped chasing after us. Christ sets the table. Christ offers the invitation. Christ calls out to us. Christ comes right to where we're at. And right where we are says, come back to me. I never left. I've been here the entire time. You're not defined by your failure. You're not defined by your mistake. But I need to know, do you love me? Because if you love me, then we can start restoration. If you love me, you can be recommissioned. But if you don't love me, if your heart's desire is not for me, then you are not ready for this relationship that I have with you. See, that's our part. He's doing everything that he can do. Our part is simply to turn back to him and say, I do love you. I do desire restoration with you. I do desire purpose with you. And I know that it only comes from you. Life with Jesus begins when you answer the question, do you love me? Do you love me? And if today you can say yes, yes, I do, then he promises to restore relationship and he promises to provide you with purpose. Will you stand with me this morning? Heavenly Father, God, we come into your presence today and 
we celebrate different milestones in life and we celebrate exciting times and we celebrate relationships and we, we celebrate what it looks like to be your church, but we can celebrate none of it without answering the question that Peter had to answer. Do you love me? And this morning, God, as we've come into this place, we have likely come into this place with some type of struggle and some type of failure. Maybe it's a failure from deep in our past, or maybe it's a failure from this very week. But if our answer in this moment is, Christ, I love you, then restoration begins today. Recommissioning begins today. There's no waiting period but restored life can happen in this moment. So in this moment, if there's anybody that's in this place this morning that would say, I need to answer the question. I need to tell Christ, I love you. You matter more than anything else in my life. You matter more than my job. You matter more than my marriage. You matter more than my family. You matter more than anything else on earth. If you can say that this morning, then you can be restored into life with Christ and also be given purpose to accomplish not only for his kingdom, but accomplish purpose in your own life. And that is why, Christ, you give us the ability for our feet to hit the floor every morning, not to serve this world, but to serve you. I love you. We love you. And we're thankful for life restored with you. Jesus Christ's name, all my family said. Over the mountains and the sea, your river runs with love for me. And I will open up my heart and let the healer set me free. I'm happy to be in the truth. could sing of your love forever. I 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 could sing of I will make room for you to do whatever you want, to do whatever you want to. If your answer to that question today was yes, you need to know that you are not alone. We would love to hear from you. We would love maybe if you would find one of the staff members after church service this morning. We'd love to talk with you, but maybe you just want to send us a message. There's these little cards in front of your seat. It's next steps. It's what do I do now? I said yes. Use those cards, but whatever you do, don't leave this place without doing something. Without responding and saying yes and then doing something on your way to that reconciliation, that restored life. Would you guys read this with me as we close out this morning? To him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ, our Lord, before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen.